Eddie Jones could yet be coming up. Oh, I hope not. I hope not, Stuart. God, I hope. I'm... I wake up and I have in my head Australia, England quarter final, and I, I got to say, I mean, Shakespeare said, "Don't look up to the stars." And I'm a great follower of the uh, of the Bard and a great believer in his wisdom, but I do feel that if Eddie meets England and, and Borthwick, it's in the stars which way that's going to go. So, hello, we're one week into a World Cup. A few surprises, some some good performances, some shakier ones. The best place to read about the World Cup is, of course, the Times and the Sunday Times. It always has been great at covering rugby. No change whatsoever with this World Cup. Make sure, if you can, you're reading the words of all the great correspondents, including the man I'm about to speak to, uh, Stuart Barnes, uh, former England fly-off, played for Bath, but I won't hold that against him. <laughs> uh, a great uh, figure in rugby for many, many years. Good morning to you, Stuart. Thank you, Stig. Hi, good morning. So we're a week in. If there's one storyline in your mind, Stuart, after the first set of games, what, what, what do you think it is? Um... I would think first game in Paris, I wasn't hugely impressed with France, but they did what they had to. Um, Scotland v South Africa then Sunday afternoon, I thought South Africa were ominously impressive. And it's a little bit, um, it's, it's a little bit like the boat and the iceberg. They're coming together, you know. It's a, you get that sense, France and South Africa are coming. But it is early days and, and a lot can happen. England probably surprised a few people. I mean, I, parenthetically, Stuart, I thought Argentina were, were absolutely awful. I mean, I can't think of a team I've seen hyped to that extent um, drop the ball literally and figuratively in such a way. I mean, they were diabolical, Argentina. And that surprised me because there was some talk, you, you'll have been in those conversations, which said, Argentina, this is the World Cup they really show them. Well, I, I've got to say, I thought there were... Uh, Steve Borthwick in press conferences was saying this could be the best Argentina team of all. And he was quite clearly trying to heap the pressure on them. And they're not. They're, they're beaten, the thing is, they beat New Zealand a year ago, but New Zealand were losing to everyone at that time. They then won at Twickenham when England were losing to everyone. We heaped these things together and we, we turned them into a great team that they're not. In 27 and 2015, they were outstanding, infinitely better. And I could have told anybody watching rugby before this tournament started that was the case. Having said that, um, I thought they deserved to be favourites to beat England because of the way England had played all year. And Stig, you're absolutely right. And, and the question is, of course, Argentina were, were risible. And the, the amount of knock-ons, the amount of 50-50 passes they threw way too early when they had an extra man and didn't have to try this, it, it makes you wonder, did they just freeze on the occasion or did England do something to really disrupt them? And I think that's the key question when we're trying to work out the context of this game. Yeah, and the context for England, because it's a great point that, because England came into this tournament with such low expectations. Yeah. They did a Leicester. Stuart, you know, I, I come from Leicester. Yeah. I watched them. I'm slightly, I'm slightly angry still they've stolen Steve Borthwick from us. But the thing he was good at, he was good at for Leicester, simplify the game with Kevin Sinfield, have an aggressive defence that works, kick well, play all the percentages. It's boring. It's boring as hell to many people, but it's efficient. Now, did they do a job on Argentina that they can do on other countries and therefore actually we need to raise our expectations or do we still need a bit more time to judge whether this England team can do anything at all? No, I think that's astute. I would say there that what Leicester did and what Borthwick did to take them from um, strugglers in the Premiership to champions was an outstanding domestic achievement. Um, you can't replicate that at test match level. If you watch the South African back three, uh, they were their entire counter-attack. You watch Australia counter-attacking. You watch France with the capacity they have if they choose to. England will not be able to just play a game of press and kick. Uh, and it is a game that under Eddie Jones, they've been enjoying playing for years. And it's, it's a natural game for Steve Borthwick. Uh, and, they played it very well against Argentina, but this was an Argentina team uh, that were nowhere near the top table at all. And they will have to find more. And that's what, you know, uh, less than 24 hours later, I, I was in the Stade Velodrome again in Marseille. And I just thought, what would happen if 
if George Ford just kept kicking to Damien Vilemza, to Cheslin Colby, to the to the South African uh, counter attackers, they would destroy England, and it was fascinating because I I wrote a piece on it for Monday and. You could have watched that game and you're saying, why is Finn Russell keeping the ball in hand in his own 22? And I think Scotland were aware of the threat of giving loose ball to South Africa. So they tried to keep ball. They tried to make uh, make things work and they risked losing the territorial battle to win the possession battle. And yeah, it looks uh, on first viewing like Scotland got it all wrong. But I think their game plan was probably the best way to beat South Africa. But that's why right at the start stick of this chat, I felt um, I walked away from that ground thinking, blimey, South Africa is strong because they have that counter-attack. They've got the rapier, but this defensive bludgeon makes it very hard to just play possession rugby against them. They looked a very complete team. And like I say, England are going to have to find an awful lot more in terms of maintaining possession than kicking it away and hoping to just put a press on in the last 20 metres. And that has been their game for, for the last two years. The end of the Jones era, the first year of the Borthwick era. So it was a major improvement. And watching the game a, a second time, England um, did a lot um, that I, I didn't see from the top of the stands uh, and, and made it look much better. But they're a long way from being contenders on the basis of this one performance. And they may not have the players. I mean, a lot of this comes down to it, isn't it? Do you have the guns in the end and maybe England don't have them um, and therefore they can't turn that around to that extent? It's worrying for Scotland, I suppose, Stuart, because the game against Ireland then becomes everything, doesn't it? I mean, that's true for both teams. I mean, they're in a hell of a group, aren't they? That, that Scotland have got a good team. You know, they've not always had a good team in my lifetime. They've got a good team, but do you fear that they're not, they're not going to prosper? Oh, even after this weekend, if England played Scotland uh, uh, on a neutral venue, I, I think Scotland would merit being favourites. They weren't that bad against South Africa. They were made to look bad. Um, that Scotland could be out at pool stage, um, and I expect them to be out at pool stage. Um, you know, a, a lot of people thought they gave South Africa some good games. They've done well in the Six Nations. They've got an attacking game. I thought they would have done more than they did, but I was overwhelmed by the power of South Africa. Now, Ireland, I think three teams can win this tournament legitimately, and I think that's France, South Africa and Ireland. I think, and I thought all the weekend, New Zealand and Scotland might just have a big game in them, might just have a big game in them. Now, I'm... I'm, looking at Scotland and Ireland and I'm looking at the organisation of Ireland and I'm sort of, my heart's bleeding a bit for Scotland because I think they're good enough to make the quarterfinals, but I don't think they're going to be there. And and I think Scotland are going to go out and I think we'll be looking um, possibly Australia, dare I say, as the team who might just throw the spokes in the wheel of someone and if everything goes right for England, everything goes right for England, they, they look as if they could get to the semi-finals. If Australia win their pool and play with, with the, the, the the power that I, I, I've witnessed against Georgia, England will have a fair chance against Wales or Fiji, um, but it won't be easy and it'll be very tight. I mean, do you, I've wanted to believe in Fiji for for forever, really. I, I, mean, I, I grew up watching Sevens. And, you know, we've all loved watching Fiji play. Uh, a lot of them played for Leicester. You know, Serevi, people like that have come to Leicester. The Polynesian game is amazing to watch. Mm-hmm. They've never managed. Western Samoa came close a couple of times. They've never quite managed to, to mirror sort of power and extravagance to, in order to get over the line. Well, Fiji this time... Do they need to beat Wales to, to, to make a, a case that they are a credible team outside of the group stage? Well, first of all, Stig, they didn't win, but I think they are a credible team. And, and I felt that there were... Oh, really? I, I felt there were one or two uh, officiated decisions, not just the referee, uh, his, his panel as well in the TMO, where I thought there were substantial errors made. I, I get fed up with... I don't like fans saying, oh, if not for that ref, we'd have won. Generally in rugby, uh, as a player and as a, 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 a journalist and as a broadcaster, I've always thought nine times out of ten, the best team will win despite. And I've been playing and watching this game a long time. 
I felt that that game in Bordeaux between Fiji and Wales, there were one or two decisions that could have swung it. And I think Fiji can look back on that and say, you know what, we probably deserve to win that. So, no, they haven't got the win, but the performance is still there. And they do look credible. But what I would say about Fiji, and I, I thought it, it, it bore itself out against Wales, when they played England, they had a fly half called Caleb Munts. And he's the least for GM back I've seen. He, he's, he's not six foot five. He doesn't run 100 metres in 10.4. He doesn't carry a ball in one hand, you know. He doesn't do any of that but he puts them in the right place and he kicks his goals. There's something um, very Anglo-Saxon about the way he plays and it gave them shape. And after that England win, I thought, this is a guy who can pull it all together. And whilst they were really good against Wales, had they had him with his goal kicking and his shaping of the match, I think they could have won that game comfortable. So I comfortably. So I think uh, Fiji still look a decent team, um, but of all the injuries and all the absentees uh, pre uh, and during the first week of, of, of the World Cup, the Fijian outside half months was the biggest loss of all. Uh, and it does take a lot away from them. You mentioned the officiating. Um, the sport is, I, I don't know if I would say it's in crisis, but all contact sports are in crisis, I yeah. think, now. Uh, wherever you go around the world, if you watch any... If you watch the NRL in Australia, if you watch American football, um, concussion, how you ref the contact is now, it's almost the first thing people talk about whenever you're watching any coverage of it. Um, do you feel confident that we're not going to, you know, it's only because England beat Argentina, we're not having a huge debate about what happened to Tom Curry, really, isn't it? It's just, they happened to win when we didn't expect them to win. Um, are you worried that officiating is going to play a role in this World Cup? Of course I'm worried. I mean, I think it... it... You know, like in most walks of life, be it uh, music or or literature, uh, sport, America has been sort of leading the way for a long time. What happens in America, a couple of years later, maybe, but it finds its way through to the UK. And, and the NFL, I, I'm sort of watching the concussion and reading about the situations uh, with lawyers. And you, you've been worrying for a long time, when is this going to reach the UK and it has reached the UK and there are uh, good reasons and there are some unscrupulous reasons um, I believe why this has become such a, a massive story um, it's an opportunity for some people alas it's a major threat to the vast majority of people who play um, I don't feel comfortable that we have really worked out um, how accidental head collisions fit in between red cards, which have historically been for violent play, and yellow cards, which came in much later, which were for cynical play. And, and we're still confused and we're having bunker systems and all of this, but you still have experts, uh, ex-coaches and players, one will say that's a clear red. Um, it's not a matter of being reckless. It was a poor, it was it head on head. He has to go. Someone else will say, well, it's a complete accident. It's an absolute nonsense. Now, I think I mean, what interests me is England just keep getting red cards. And, and I hear colleagues and I hear coaches and England players saying, discipline we've got to sort out our discipline but it's not about discipline it's about technique now I know that Jesse Creel of South Africa was involved in a head-on-head -head at the weekend but if you watch the South Africans in, in in Europe in particular in the Champions Cup their technique was almost similar to when I was playing the game and the dinosaurs were roaming the earth if that was the case you got your body at right angles and you drove head in with your shoulder in the right situation but now it's about it, it. It's all about being able to dislodge. It's the power of the hit. Now a hit isn't even legal, but you hear coaches they talk about that was a great hit. Commentators say yeah. what a great hit. A hit well, is illegal. With Tuolangi, they did it, they did it the weekend and they talk talking up Tuolangi for a legal hit, but they were they, they were all about the size of the hit. But, but there's your problem. It's there is no such thing as a legal hit. 
So if all the experts and all the ex-players and all the coaches call it a legal hit, no wonder we're in a situation where we've got so many problems and where England keep having this rigid upper body because they're coming in. You either got the Farrell situation where he drives up with the shoulder to try and dislodge, or it's sort of shoulder to shoulder, in which case, even though the catcher or the carrier, his head might dip forwards first, but nevertheless, it's the tackler's duty to make sure he's not in a situation. And I, and I understand that. And so Tom Curry had no malice and there was nothing reckless there, but his technique was terrible. And I don't blame him, by the way. I think the coaching in England uh, is driven by this sort of macho capacity to dislodge ball, to turn over. And players are being taught from infancy to tackle with their heads high. And it, it, you're always in something like a World Cup or a European Champions Cup, you're going to get this situation. And I just say to people, go and watch um, the Stormers from Cape Town. Go and watch the Sharks from Durban. 99 times out of 10, their technique is dated from another time because they've worked out. They don't want to get players sent off and they don't want to get players concussed either. We, at the moment, I think, in, in the UK and in England in particular, pay lip service to what is going on. And until we take it really seriously, then we're going to be getting red cards. So used to used to, so what you're talking about is when I used to play rugby when I was a kid, it was the it's the head sort of behind the bum, isn't it, of the person you're tackling. You're sort of get, you're getting your head out of the way, but you're you're keeping low and keeping your head out of the way. Well, yes, yeah, your head goes one side, your shoulders are the same, and you drive through. Now, last week I I saw something uh, online, and it, it was an RFU thing about how to tackle, and in fact it had the head slewed across the body with the shoulder in front of it. So almost like the tackler falls over him, which risks terrible things, injuries to the neck and head. So even the stuff that's coming out from the RFU is dangerous and wrong. And so this is the state of crisis that we are in. We have forgotten how to affect a tackle. And if you can't remember how to tackle and coaches at RFU level and schools level don't know how to do it properly, what hope? For anyone, what, what, hope for anyone? what hope for anyone? Let's uh, let's let's finish on a cheerier prospect, a cheerier topic, Stuart. You've been there in France. France seems like a great country to be hosting this World Cup. France in September. Yeah. Um, what's it been like? How's it felt to you? Being, you've been to a lot of games. You've you've moved around the country doing it. What's it What's it felt like? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I think the sense of occasion in, is incredible. France has. France is very different. It doesn't have that, uh, dare I say it, slightly middle-class feel that there is to the game in Scotland, Ireland uh, uh, and England and Australia. Um, it, it's a passion uh, for the people. Uh, and obviously in France, there's a, uh, there's a great patriotism as, as well surrounding the whole event. So... You know, the first Friday night in, in in Stade de France, the occasion was epic. I I, I didn't think I, the game was brilliant, but you know, I've been to a lot of first up games and they're not. But the occasion was wonderful. Um, just the sense of excitement. You know, I, I, I saw three games the first weekend. Obviously, France were only in one of them, but uh, Le Marseille was just rebounding around the grounds and in Marseille. You know, there was Sweet Caroline where you had the England fans and then there, there would be the French anthem just overwhelming it, coming from all the, the, the restaurants and bars on the boulevard heading towards my hotel. So France are going to do a great job. They did in 2007 uh, where their team had its great day in Cardiff beating the All Blacks and they, they froze in France. This lot aren't going to freeze, so they've got a team to get behind which just makes the magnifies the occasion, and um, I think it is going to be a great World Cup in terms of of the sense of epic, in the sense of entertainment. I think you've got defending champion South Africa, who we all love to boo uh, for a long time, South Africa, um, but the way in which they have embraced uh, 
change in, in ways more important than rugby has been wonderful. Um, they have embraced change in terms of how they play the game. South Africa right now feel like the good boys and France feel like the boys everyone wants to win because you want France there because you just sense a World Cup final with France in it. It's, it Paris is just going to explode with excitement. So I'm pretty excited after one week. But uh, if it does get that South Africa-France thing, that would be uh, amazing. And in the meantime, there are so many good stories there. Ireland... They might go out at the quarterfinals. They might make the final. New Zealand have got a game in them, and, and who knows? Eddie Jones could yet be coming up. Oh, I hope not. I hope if not, we, Stuart. God, know, I hope. I'm, I wake up and I have in my head Australia, England quarterfinal, and I, I got to say, I mean, Shakespeare said, "Don't look up to the stars." And I'm a great follower of the uh, of the Bard and a great believer in his wisdom, but. I do feel that if Eddie meets England and, and Borthwick, it's in the stars which way that's going to go. So I think if you're an English fan, having beaten Argentina, you think, great, we can top this pool, and they should. And I would say I was I was extremely ex impressed uh, when I watched Australia uh, over, you know, over a couple of hours in detail against Georgia. I, I thought they were the most improved team in the tournament. So... You know, English fans might just be thinking, "Come on, Australia, beat Fiji and Fiji and Wales, and top the group, so we don't have to play each other." Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, one one game you want to watch this weekend? People, what, if you could only watch one. What's the what's the, what's a good one in your mind? Oh, you? I love. I'm really looking forward to Ireland versus Tonga. Tonga have that capacity to rattle you in all sorts of ways. And Ireland, you know, Romania are one of the weaker teams. So they scored 90 points. It's very hard to gauge anything. But I, I, I love the intelligence Ireland bring to rugby. I love the power and the passion that Tonga brings. So for me, yeah, it's got to be Ireland versus Tonga. That's a great tip. Stuart, what a pleasure speaking to you. I look forward to speaking to you again next week. We're going to try and do this all the way through the World Cup. Uh, it's a great way of enjoying all these games and all these issues are, are fresh. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Thanks, Steve. And just a reminder then, if you do want to read about the World Cup, best place to read it is in the Times and the Sunday Times. And uh, if you uh, want to listen to a breakfast programme, you can always listen to me with Asma Mir every Monday to Thursday from 6am on Times Radio. Thank you for joining us.